everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone is doing well amidst all these uh, COVID phase three. Um, at least it's a lot nicer out and uh, we can actually get outside and enjoy the get great outdoors. So for those of you who don't know, I am the Programs and Communications Manager at the Marine Museum. And uh, we're happy to say that the Marine Museum is open at the moment, Wednesday to Sunday, 10 to 4. And uh, we are still located at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor, and you're very welcome to stop in and for a free guided tour of the gallery. And um, yeah, so feel free to stop in. We're, we're here um, almost all week and uh, lots of things to talk about. So for those of you who don't know, the Marines Museum's mission um, is very much to be able to connect people with the maritime heritage of Kingston and the Great Lakes. Now, part of that maritime heritage, people generally think about the social and economic history of the region, but in my opinion, that maritime heritage is, is as much about the history as it is about the people and the beings who inhabit that space, who live in the space. And on that note, brings in the environmental and water protection and the protection of our local ecosystems. We have a, for the, sorry, I'm getting a whole class, difficult going live. So, um, and again, for those of you who don't know, as I said, we're at Portsmouth Olympic Harbor, but last summer we purchased our uh, 55 Ontario Street historic location. And we are set to move back, but uh, COVID-19 has pushed our plans back slightly. But um, so in the meantime, we're gearing up with a new strategic plan steering into the future, which I welcome you to read on our website. And part of it outlines our um, dedication to incorporating the environmental uh, history and narrative into our gallery space and into our programs. A number of which, um, some of our programs already touch upon those types of topics like invasive species and water protection. So on that note, um, it has set us upon a path to partner with an organization called Swim, Drink, Fish. And um, it's all about supporting the education, advocacy and protection of our Great Lakes water resources. Um, they are a Canadian non for profit uh, who works with the community to monitor, advocate and protect our freshwater sources, ensuring the gold standard for protection and restoration, swimmable, drinkable, fishable water, and that's ensuring that, is, that, that that is achieved. So that is not only for us humans, but also for the, um, the organisms that rely on those um, freshwater resources for the ecosystem. So both of our organizations are charities, as you might have picked up, and so we welcome um, any donations that you're able to make um, either today or in the future to support that the work that both of us do. And um, the, on the chat, you'll see that there are links to our website to make an online donation. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Matson, who is the founder and president of Swim Drink Fish, who's going to answer all of your questions today, I hope. And but we've tried not to pester him for too long um, because we know that this is a lunchtime talk and we all want to get back out in the outdoors. So Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you hear us okay? And your mic is back on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michelle. And hi, Hannah. Hi. All right, Mark, so uh, maybe just to start us off, you can explain a bit more about what Swim Drink Fish is and your connection to it and the work that you're doing at, at, at present. Sure. Well, thanks, Michelle, and thanks um, to the Kingston um, Marine Museum. I know you're the Mu Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston, <laughs> but um, you know, you, this this summer, and Hannah can say this too, but we were really we were having a difficult time um, finding a place and a partner for our lab, as you know, with COVID, and it's been very difficult. And I just want to thank you and your board and the organization for giving us an opportunity to. Um, to partner with you, it's um, really important. I'm, um, I, you know, grew up in Kitchener, but we've always had a place on Wolf Island my entire life. Um, so that's really where I connected with the Great Lakes, um, the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario. I went to Queen's University. I spent every summer on Wolf Island. I love that waterfront um, as much as anything else in my life. And um, after I went to law school, I practiced in Kingston as well at the prisons and did civil rights and environmental law. And one of my first big environmental cases was the Storyton landfill, which is out on Washburn Road um, on the Cataraqui River. And I learned a lot um, about environmental law at that time through that process. And eventually, um, you know, I gave up my practice to represent and protect Lake Ontario. And I became the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper in 2001. 
And I dedic you know, and I think all the reasons why I decided to do that um, are linked to my connection to Kingston and Wolf Island. So it's a really important, oh, am I coming through? Am I still there? So it's, it, it, it's such an important water body to me. And um, a number of the early cases that I worked on around were in Kingston with respect to sewage as the Lake Ontario waterkeeper. And you can hear me? I should just keep going, <laughs> okay. I was with the Lake Ontario waterkeeper and we did um, some work around the, um, the landfill at Bell Island Park in Gakata Rockway and around sewage. And so um, my work obviously has grown since then um, and throughout the lake and then ultimately to become Swim Drink Fish. And Swim Drink Fish is now an organization that oversees the Fraser Riverkeeper in Vancouver and North Saskatchewan Riverkeeper in Edmonton. We've created platforms like the Swim Guide, um, Great Lakes Guide, the Watermark Project, and of course still Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. So for me, um, you know, our work there this summer is really just bringing me home to the place I love the most. Um, a couple of years ago, I'll just also mention this, we had a real opportunity with the W. Garfield Weston Foundation to help fund what we thought were projects on the lake that were going to um, really change the way our communities see Lake Ontario. And so one of the projects was the waterfront restoration at the pier, Breakwater Park. And uh, Gord Downey was on our board. He's a friend of mine. He was from Kingston, as many of you know, and he lived across the street at one point for many years with his family across from Breakwater Park. And so we really wanted to help support the, the pier and turning it into, you know, because of our work on sewage, but to have a, a state-of-the-art, world-class, deep water swimming pier in an urban setting. Um, and so we helped um, the city of Kingston, federal government and provincial government with funding to really turn Breakwater Park and create the Gord Edgar Downey Pier. And we're so proud of that. It's, it, I think it's the only urban deep water swimming pier on the Great Lakes. It's so beautifully designed by Claude Cormier and the architect. Um, it really takes into account the community, all members of the community. Um, and it's really about access and beauty and connection to the lake to really understand that it is a wilderness place that provides us with swimmable drinkable fish or water. So everything um, about our organization has its roots in Kingston and even Swim Guide now, which is being used by 5 million people um, around nine countries and hundreds of affiliates throughout the US, Mexico, et cetera. Really its roots are right there in Kingston. And so it's so exciting to be able to start the Kingston Monitoring Hub there this summer and to look for um, what we're doing is really we're sampling, which is what we've done for 20 years and teaching people how to sample and how to understand um, recreational water um, and what it is that makes water um, fit for recreation um, or not fit and how we communicate that to the public so that ultimately we can build a community who uh, can restore waters for more access to water. So that's what Hannah's there for. I love the, uh, the lab coat, very, um, very professional, swim drink fish. Um, and you can see the circles under the swim drink fish name. And what we did is we saw don't swim, don't fish, don't drink, little lines across them. And, and our goal is to take those off and to make all water swimmable, drinkable, fishable for everyone everywhere. So that's why, um, that's what we do, that's who we are. Um, and that's why it's so exciting to be back in Kingston and thanking you guys for really giving us a home this summer. Thank you so much, Mark. I mean, I was, uh, it's great that you were talking about the Gord, the uh, Downey, Gord Downey Pier. I was uh, driving home the other night and, uh, of course, you get you get stuck in the King Street uh, traffic parking lot there, and uh, you know looking out over the water, and it had me thinking that you know, how fortunate we are to be on this beautiful location, and the work that was done on that pier and in that section, um, especially over the recent, but let alone over the last hundred years, it's changed dramatically. But to know that now we're finally starting to recognize how important that space is and use it in a way that makes it accessible to everybody. Um, and it, it's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful to see that. And I, it's uh, great that we have people who are actively working in, that, in those directions. So I, I wanted to, you touched about a number of things that you're doing um, and I kind of just given the current uh, climate, but uh, issues that are happening around us and get, in terms of the pandemic, that had an impact on any of the work that Swim Drink Fish has been doing and uh, how you would 
adapt to those types of changes if you had any? Well, if, if you know, the pandemic's affecting us all in every way, um, I'd say particularly with respect to our monitoring hubs, it's been a very difficult summer. Um, we didn't even know if we'd be able to get out on the water. Um, I know our organization um, has done a lot of work and Hannah can talk to you about it, about the protocols to try um, and that allow us to get out on the water this summer to do our sampling. Um, obviously protocols with respect to going to the office, um, both of you are in masks, I'm all alone at home, so I don't have to wear one because um, there's no one else here with me. But I think the bigger issue about it is that, you know, it's all about public health. Everything's about public health. Um, our swim guide, our work on the water, enforcing environmental laws was all about public health. And with COVID, it also has that balance with public health. Obviously, what do we do to protect people? And at the same time, how do we balance that with the need for access this summer? Um, you know, public health, health and wellness, you know, are so con are, they're so connected with getting outdoors. And we know getting outdoors is better for people this summer than being indoors. And so we've really struggled with how do we um, get outside, maintain our sampling to allow people to know when the water's safe for swimming, et cetera, get people out in, in, onto the water, outdoors, healthy, but at the same time, be safe and physical distance, um, making sure that um, the number one priority is if you're gonna go to the water and you're gonna go into the water is that you're safe. And so balancing um, safety and access has been a real challenge, not just for Lake Ontario Waterkeepers, Swim Dirt Fish, but for all of our affiliates uh, and Swim Guide right across um, in the world really. And so everyone's dealing with that. And I know many of the viewers and you guys no, too. Some cities decided the best way to deal with that is just close the beach. Others have decided to make beaches just open for people who are using it for swimming, not for sunbathing or for picnicking, for example. Others have limited their beaches just to people from the community. Um, everyone's balancing it a little different. Um, I think everyone's trying their hardest to find a way through this summer. And certainly um, our Kingston Monitoring Hub, I'm very proud that we've been able to get it rolling and that Hannah is able to get out there, um, do the environmental health safety surveys, um, pick the sites and start the monitoring at these, at these sites so that we'll gather the data to understand um, at the end of the year whether or not there are some more places um, on Kingston's waterfront that are fit for uh, turning into recreational water um, sites. That's great. Yeah, I'm sure it's, uh, it's, it's been difficult well, absolutely, as you said, it's been difficult for everyone, but absolutely, it's making sure that you can continue to access it in a safe and, and healthy way. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you. So you talked a little bit of you're doing water testing and you're monitoring, et cetera. So what, what exactly is the, the threat that the waters are facing um, that you need to do these, this, this monitoring? Well, Hanny can talk about that too. Um, she looks like she knows way more than me about science. <laughs> um, but when it comes to recreational water, it's really an issue around bacteria. E. coli is what in freshwater we um, use as the standard for the risk assessment as to whether or not the water's um, not so much safe, we don't call it safe, but whether um, it, it's, it, it's whether you have the information upon which to make sure that if you do use the water, it's safe. So um, E. coli is a really important indicator and that's the measurement that we use to put a green, light on this on the swim guy which means go a uh, red which means stop or a yellow which means um you need more information before you can make your own decision about whether the water's safe and so ontario the provincial water quality objective is 100 colony form units per 100 milliliters that's of e coli that's how they judge whether or not water or the beaches should be given a green or a red or a yellow um, and in some places in Ontario, it's 200 CFUs per colony forming units of E. coli per 100 milliliters. And so, so that's the standard. It's, it's recognized um, in, in Ontario and Canada and other jurisdictions, and that's what we measure it against. But what is it that really causes um, bacteria in the water? There's so many different things. And we do try and understand that through our environmental health and safety surveys, but it can be 
sewage from the community bypasses. It can be from stormwater, it can be from ducks and birds. It can be from other discharges that have taken place. Um, all of those things can contribute to the bacteria in the water that um, you need to understand before you make a decision as to whether it's safe for you and your family to go in the water or even just throwing sticks to your dog in the water. Um, it's important information that you wanna know um, before accessing the water. Is that fair, Hannah? Absolutely, Mark. <laughs> Oh, that's great. So, well, not great, but uh, good to look, get to get a better idea of what those issues are. And um, of course, as, as you were saying about whether or not it's, you might be able to go and use that space, but if you're using it safely, ensuring that if there is some level of E. coli, then at least you're, you're aware of it and you can take those proper precautions as a, as a public member. Yes. Right. So uh, in terms of the, you do monitoring a, a number of different locations. So across the Great Lakes and across specifically in Lake Ontario, what, um, is it swimmable, drinkable, fishable? Are there areas that are quite higher risk or more severe than others? Um, it's really hard to make any generalizations. That's why it's really important that you do the um, sampling. We have funding from the federal government, Environment Canada and Climate Change to really set up six hubs. Um, Zibasing First Nation, Kettle Point, Niagara, Kingston, Toronto, and we'll add another one next year. And that's what the Kingston Hub is all about. It's a demonstration project where we're really going to areas that aren't currently monitored, but people are using the water. And we really want to get the information. Um, and in Kingston, we're very lucky to have a partnership, not only with you, but with Kingston Utilities, the city of Kingston, Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox, and Addington Public Health. They're all really supportive of our work because they, you know, I think as the city of Kingston, which truly is for me anyways, the freshwater capital of the world, it has real time monitoring on its pipes, which is no other city I know of has that, um, has the Gord Edgar Downey Pier, Deepwater Urban Swimming Pier. It's made a real effort to connect the citizens back to the lake. So we feel like the sampling that we're doing this summer in Kingston will really, is an important part of the information they need to make decisions going forward about if there's gonna be more access to places for the city of Kingston. Can the city of Kingston become even a better place um, for the community to access the lake? Um, and so we're really excited about that partnership. I think that's what distinguishes our work in Kingston as well as you know our advisory committee is that we really are collaborative and transparent and that it feels really good for a, a nonprofit, a charity like ours, to be working with government, um, public health officials, um, a water utility, and the community towards a common goal, which is swimmable water. So that's what, what really, I think, sets Kingston apart, is that um, it's really ahead of the game in terms of its collaboration and cooperation between the different um, stakeholders. That's great to hear, uh, Mark. I mean, yes, we live in since we have a bit of a bias, but that's uh, that's great to hear that there's that much community contribution and collaboration. Um, you, there's an element that I recall that you're talking about about citizen science. I wonder if you might uh, ex expand on that a little bit, explain what it is and how much somebody might get involved. With it. Yeah, well, citizen science truly is the um, the future. That's why our hubs are based on we're trying to make them scalable and sustainable so that the public can be engaged and ultimately learn how to do this work um, and uh, around sampling. Um, there's so many different things that citizens can do uh, around citizen science, um, taking photos on a regular basis. We have something, a tool called Gassy, where they can take photos and deliver them to us. Um, there's it's a swim guide also has a photo sharing um, um, opportunity that they can take photos, report pollution, um, there are other tools, things like iNaturalist, which are really cool citizen science tools. But we try and take that one step further as we try and teach and engage the citizens into um, or in um, learning how to sample water. So it's a little step above taking a photo or, or um, just straight engagement. And there's a lot of science involved, as Hannah can talk to. Um, it's a real, there are... Um, standard operating procedures in order to make the samples be really legitimate and valid and, and have that sort of um, 
you know, that real, that validation around the samples so that they can be shared with the public. And so we are trying to help um, inform and engage a new group of citizens who, ult who ultimately can do all the real simple stuff, but also can maybe take that next step and also be um, water quality samplers as well and share that data. But citizen science, why is it so important? It's because we just don't have the money as governments in order to gather all the information we need. And so governments are starting to realize if with technology, if they can involve citizens in gathering data in a way that is, can be validated, and can be used scientifically, that that's the greatest um, um, hope for getting the data we need to restore and protect swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. So citizen science is a real, um, it's, it's aspirational. I think it's doable. And I think we're trying to prove that um, through our hubs. And it's really exciting what it can mean for the future for the protection of the environment and our lakes and waters. That's, um... It, it, I mean, it definitely makes sense to try, you're talking about uh, having access to resources to make sure that you can do the monitoring that you need to do. And what you were saying that, I mean, that kind of my next question was kind of what you were doing with the, with the information you were gathering, but it sounds like it's very much then becomes all about advocacy and being able to report back and say, look, this is the information, the data that we've gathered from all these different locations uh, to demonstrate the work that needs to be done and uh, the impact the work is doing, of course, as well. It was, is there any other other elements that you'd be using the, the, the data for? Well, the data that we're collecting at the Kingston Hub and that many of our affiliates are collecting around E. coli and bacteria sampling, it goes on to what is just like a world-class data sharing platform, which is called SwimGuide. I mean, SwimGuide does something revolutionary is that it takes raw data and turns it into usable information for the public. So you want, you might not be a citizen science and you might not know a lot about E. coli or sampling, but you do want to know if the water that you're swimming in or, or where the beaches are open, where you can go swim, swimming and take your family, you want to know that information. So this data we're collecting by going into swim guide, it comes, it has a, it has a use by the public. They can use that information and it helps give them information that they want. They just want to know where they can go swimming safely. And so where they can find a beach, um, where they can go um, for the day to go surfing or paddling. And so Swim Guide does that. And, and that is only possible because of, um, of the incredible opportunities that data sharing platforms are creating for our communities. And so as an environmental organization, we're very unique. We like to think that we're in the confluence of um, people, water, and technology. And so Swim Guide, the monitoring, the hubs, and the public um, really sharing in the middle of, um, you know, sharing data and sharing ideas and ultimately connecting with water. So, um, yeah, I would encourage everyone to use Swim Guide. It's a free app on Google and Apple, and it's also a website, www.theswimguide.org. So, I would use, you know, and you can use that wherever you go. You can be in British Columbia, you can be in Alabama, you can be in Ontario. We have the beaches and we have the water quality and that's what's so amazing about it. That, sorry, I'm just getting handed. Uh, that's, I mean, that's great to hear that there's, there is that opportunity to know that the, the data that somebody as a citizen scientist might, um, how, how the, that's impacting on the local public and to know that. So we talked obviously a little bit about um, the larger causes work that you're doing, et cetera. So I thought maybe we turn to, to Hannah here to talk a bit about more of the hands-on and the work that she's doing right here on our, at our location, because as I said earlier, we are a partner organization now with Swim Drink Fish and we're very on that, because of that partnership, we've, uh, we've offered a very modest <laughs> space to be able to operate a lab in Kingston. And uh, so we're very happy to have Hannah with us, which is why we're both standing in our storefront gallery. Uh, so Hannah, maybe just talk a little bit about who you are and how you got involved with uh, Swim Drink Fish. Sure, so uh, I just, I got involved with Swim Drink Fish actually a few summers ago. Um, I was teaching sailing lessons at the Wolf Island Boat Club and heard about a job posting with Swim Drink Fish through there um, and actually ended up doing some sampling uh, over on Wolf Island at the Boat Club, as well as at Breakwater Park, uh, which is where the Gord Downey Pier is now. 
Um, and I really enjoyed that experience and learned a lot about the waterfront that I, you know, I grew up in Kingston. I've spent many years enjoying the Kingston waterfront, but I kind of found out there was a lot that I didn't know about what can be done to protect the waters. Um, so luckily there is another opportunity there uh, to get involved with the citizen science monitoring hub that's new in, in the summer. So I was very excited to be able to come back and work with some great fish on that initiative. That's terrific. And we're grateful to have you sharing your space with us. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do a little behind the scenes uh, tour of not only the gallery in our storage space, but back to where Hannah's uh, lab is set up. So Hannah, will you uh, lead the way? Absolutely. <laughs> Let me go ahead. I'm going to condense this down. Getting very creative with our second <laughs> virtual talk here. So yes, here we go is... and behind the scenes. This is great. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, this is just great. <laughs> yeah, you can see all our storage back facilities back here while our artifacts are stored. This is only one of the locations. But uh, back here, we also have a space um, that basically a small room that has some storage and where Hannah has truly set up a uh, an amazing little lab space here. So I'm going to flip the camera around so that you can see. This is uh, right. Here we go. Here it comes. Yeah, so this is the space where we keep all of our equipment uh, for the water quality monitoring. Um, and thank you so, so much to the Kingston Marine Museum for providing this. This is really what's making uh, the water sampling here possible. So I can't thank you enough, Michelle. <laughs> um, so I'll just give you a quick little run through some of the equipment we have here um, that allows us to do the water quality monitoring. And just before I get started, I, Mark mentioned before that this citizen science initiative um, is really, really cool because it's providing low cost accessible uh, equipment for people to be able to monitor the water quality in their communities. So we'll show you some of the equipment, but one of the really cool things I think about this is that there isn't actually too, too much equipment or too much complicated science involved. So when we say that this is accessible, this is really something that anyone can learn, um, which is fabulous. It just makes everyone able to uh, collect information about their local water, share that information with their communities, and really connect to water in their area. So right here we have our incubator. This is where we store the water samples once we brought them in from the lake. Uh, and this is what's going to keep the water samples at the temperature that we want them at. So right now, I'll just open it quickly so we don't so we don't mess up the temperature. But right now, we have some samples in there that I collected yesterday. And then moving into the little lab office here. I'm coming. <laughs> So this is our great little lab space we have. This is where uh, we do the processing and the analysis of the water samples. So I'll just show you here. These are the water bottles that we use uh, to collect the samples from the lake at uh, different uh, locations in Kingston. And then once we bring those sa samples back to the lab, we add them into this container here, which is called the Quanti tray. And to that uh, quantity tray in the water, we add a uh, chemical that is going to allow us to see um, the total coliforms as well as the E. coli that are present in that water sample. So once we've done that, um, as you saw there, we put the water sample into the incubator. It has to stay there to process for a 24 hour period. And then once we take those out, uh, we can use the quantity trays and um, the UV light we have here, and we can see, we can, we're able to quantify how much E. coli uh, and total coliforms are in those samples that we took from the water. Oh, awesome. It's quite the little setup back here. So what are the machines that are next to you? So this machine here is the quantity tray sealer. Uh, so it's pretty basic. It's just once we put the water into these trays, um, that's what's going to seal it back up so we don't have the sample <laughs> spilling out again. Makes sense. And this here is a UV light. Uh, so one of the chemicals that we add to the sample um, is going to, when it interacts with E. coli, uh, the reaction leads to um, a fluorescing of the chemical. So when you put this tray under the UV light, the samples that are uh, positive for E. coli will show up as fluorescent. 
That's awesome. So where have you been doing your samples lately, recently? Yeah, so uh, we had a few uh, sites in Kingston and maybe Mark can touch on this a bit more because um, it was a bit of a process um, figuring out what are the best sites to sample in Kingston. Um, but as you know, there's some, I've been doing some sampling just out front of mm -hmm. the harbor here, as well as farther along the shore. Um, so yeah, that's been really exciting. And that's Smith Olympic Harbor for anyone who just joined us. Mark, did you want to have something to add to that part? Where are the sampling sites? Um, well, I think, you know, we picked Hannah and I and in our advisory panel, we, we really tried to pick places where we saw people using the water. Um, that was a real criteria. Um, also, that we thought might be part of the future, some where the information might help. I know the Kingston Waterfront planning process is looking at paths um, along the area just to the, the west of um, the Portsmouth Olympic Harbor. So we picked two sites there. One of the sites um, is an area where we, on July 1st, um, Christopher West on the board of the Kingston Marine Museum has been you know, swimming since 2005 when he came to Kingston. So we just, we wanted, we didn't, you know, it's a tough summer um, for a lot of reasons. And so we chose places where there are people and um, where we think the information can be really helpful in the future. That's great. So I'm gonna flip us back around here. because great. Uh, I'm conscious and by the way, of Hannah, really great a job. Just a really good job by Hannah there. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Mark. I'm glad you got to see the full setup. <laughs> it's uh, I'm constantly amazed. It's every time I come back here, it seems like there's another piece of equipment back here. So <laughs> it's uh, it's nice to finally get the walkthrough. So I'm just going to take us back up to the gallery because we've had a few questions come in from our, our listeners. Thank you again so much for listening. Thank you, Michelle. All right. So we're going back through to through our storage space. Um, that has all our beautiful artifacts and back into the gallery space. This is quite the evolution from last time we did a virtual talk when I was sitting at home in front of a computer trying to talk to everybody. So this is quite nice. So the first, one of the first questions we had uh, was about volunteer opportunities. So if uh, someone was interested where you were located and how they might get in touch with uh, their interest in volunteering. So the easiest thing to first do is to call- yeah, sure. I mean, the easiest thing to do is to um, call our office, 416-861-1237. Um, and let us know that you're in Kingston and you'd like to volunteer at the Kingston Hub. The other thing you can do is, um, you know, I, I, can, I can put it online. You can, you can email me, mark at waterkeeper.ca um, for anyone who's interested in, in coming out. Um, volunteers this summer might be, it, it, you know, at least we want people to come out and see what we're doing and engage and learn about the organization and maybe we can find more volunteering um, opportunities in the future. It's a little tough this summer given COVID and physical distancing and how we're working even in the office we can't really bringing anybody really in the office and things so we've got to work that out but if it's safe um, it's real opportunity at least to come and visit and see what you know there might be things you can do or help but just to see the work we're doing and to be um, introduced to our work and to our organization. It's a real opportunity for us. I mean, just look how much benefit we've got from meeting you, Michelle. You never know. <laughs> and I will just add on to that quickly. Um, there is also a Kingston email. So if you email a Kingston hub at swimdrinkfish.ca, um, I can answer those emails. And like Mark said, we aren't able to do as much uh, hands-on volunteering this summer just because of all the COVID protocols, but I'm still very excited for anyone who wants to come down and learn more about the process. Um, there's also ways that you can get involved by uploading photos and stuff like that. So feel free to reach out. Maybe I'll get you to put that email in the yeah, chat absolutely. afterwards. I think we have one of our amazing summer students working on uh, sharing some of those links with you on the YouTube chat. So take a look at that. And we'll also make sure that we post it on our social media feeds. That's at Marine Museum Kingston uh, and um, Swim Drink Fish at Swim Drink Fish is, is uh, the one for social media. So another question we had uh, had to do with the 
water from the sampling. So it had to do with how, uh, how deep or how far you collect the water. So I guess how far offshore and, and would there be interest in getting water samples from deeper areas, uh, potential for divers to help, for instance? That's actually a good question. Go ahead. Yes, so I can maybe answer this a little bit uh, as it pertains to Kingston. Um, so the sampling that I've been doing, we generally take at about, uh, we say sort of thigh, thigh height. So I'm in the water up to my thighs and we take the sample from a foot or two below the surface. Um, this is generally the area where we see most people interacting with the water, swimming and wading and that sort of thing. So that's why we're interested in testing the water quality there. Um, but there is absolutely an interest in looking at water quality in the deeper uh, areas of the water. I know one of the sites I've been sampling, there are a lot of divers that I've been seeing. Um, so if the diver who put this question in uh, is interested, I would encourage you to reach out uh, to the email that I just mentioned and uh, that's something that we'd be interested that's in. That's wonderful. We love our divers. We, uh, the marine knows its existence to its divers. So thank you so much for asking that question. Uh, so another one we had come in a little earlier by email uh, is a bit, a bit longer. Um, and I think we'll probably, Mark, we're probably gonna reach out to them individually because it's a bit of a complex question, but it had to do a bit about the current status of the Toronto sewage alert system. And um, it currently was discussed a number of years ago. Uh, and whether or not um, there's a group, I guess, involved that's interested in, in learning a bit more about it and how they might be able to help at all. Yeah, um, you know, the, I think I've mentioned it already. The most state-of-the-art um, alert system for um, stormwater and sewage discharges is in Kingston. Um, you have what's called real-time monitoring. So Kingston Utilities has gone out. And um, if you go on the Kingston Utilities site, they have all the pipes and they'll let you know if anything's coming out of the pipes or not in real time. That's, that's what everybody wants. Um, um, a lot of the other cities, including Toronto, they'll do daily alerts um, with respect to bypasses, but they don't have all the pipes listed and they don't have monitoring at all their pipes. So generally in Toronto, it's, you know, if it rains, it's, you know, 24 to 48 hour or 48 hour waiting period is the general recommendation, don't go in the water, but you don't know if anything's gone into the water or not specifically because they don't monitor every pipe. But Kingston does, which makes Kingston sort of like the gold standard for other cities as we move forward. Um, you, that's the sort of information we should all have. I personally think, you know, in this day and age, we should all have that information. When pipes are discharging into our waters, we should know about it. And the city of Kingston has been able to do that. And now it, it's sort of, it's sort of set the bar high and others want that as well. And there's so many people in Toronto who want that for sure. And the, and the, and the, and the, the person who wrote that question, um, you know, they should really look into what Kingston has and we should make sure that we continue to encourage the city of Toronto or any other city that we're in to really move towards that type of public notification and alert system. Sorry, technical problems with trying to turn my mic back on. Um, thank you so much, Mark, for answering that question. And as I said, I think that you're going to reach out to them a bit more individually because it was a bit of a complex, uh, complex question and there was a lot more into the email than what I iterated. Um, I'm just going to ask our summer student if we have any last questions come in from uh, anyone following on YouTube or on Facebook. Nope, all good. No questions that's terrific so i just want to say again thank you so much mark and for hannah to uh, to join us today and talk a bit about more about swim drake fish as i said we are very uh, fortunate to be able to partner with you um, now and going forward the uh the green museum as i've said before is very much concerned about the maritime heritage and connecting people with it uh, that's the maritime heritage of kingston and the great lakes and just to you know to remind you that maritime heritage isn't necessarily about the social economic history of a region it's as much about uh, the history as it is about the, uh, the, the people and the beings that use that space, that live in that space. Uh, and so that includes our ecosystems. And um, the Marine Museum of the Great Lakes at Kingston is very much committed to ensuring that the environmental narrative becomes a part of that larger narrative at the museum. And that includes uh, when we get back to our old, new old site, I like to call it, 
um, and you know, start to reestablish the museum as a new 21st century museum, that, that will be a large part of the gallery space as well as the programs that we deliver. Um, so on that note, I would like to say thank you again so much, everyone, for joining us today. If you would like uh, to follow us, either the Swim, Drink, Fish or the Marine Museum, uh, we encourage you to do so on social media. The Marine Museum is at Marine Museum Kingston and um, Swim, Drink, Fish is at Swim, Drink, Fish, an easy one to remember. And of course, just to remind you that uh, both of these organizations are charities and uh, for the Marine Museum and the donation allow us to be able to deliver programs like this one and um, so they very much go in terms of going back into the outreach programs in the community and as you've seen today um, all the funding that Swim Drink Fish receives is all about that monitoring everything you heard today is where those is where that support is going and to do all the great cause that we know um, is definitely worth doing and advocating for. So again uh, the links to donate are on the Facebook uh, the, sorry YouTube chat and same goes for any other additional information we covered today. So thank you again so much for listening. Thank you, Mark, uh, you, and thank you, Hannah, for joining us in person today. If you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, send us a message on Facebook or email marmuseum at, sorry, marmuse, M-U-S, at marmuseum.ca, it's a mouthful. And uh, we'll be sure to pass it on to uh, Swim Drink Fish, either Mark or Hannah. Thank you again so much, everybody. Stay cool and uh, go out and enjoy the outdoors. Thank you. Thank you.